Testing, testing. Yeah, I have totally forgotten my microphone. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> All right, beautiful. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night with, I don't know, what, um, whatever this might find you. I am, um, I'm very happy to be here. And, um, and uh, what else, what else, what else? Uh, uh, wait, let me situate myself right now. So, all right, so, what are we doing? Well, I'm losing track of it. Okay, okay, let's start with the basics. Hello, if you're new to the channel, my name is Jose Luis. This is Parametric Camp. We do live streams on computational design. We record tutorials, we do exercises, we do videos, etc. And then we cut them out, we edit them, and then we publish them as nice polished videos. If you want to stay up to date as to when do we go live and when do we do this, it's roughly every Friday in the morning. Otherwise, you can follow us on social media. We post when we go live. And there's a link to a Google calendar that you can subscribe to on this video so that you can also see on your Google Calendar notifications about when do we go live. Um, all right, so that's one thing. Second thing is, hello, everyone. Good to see everything, everyone again. Fernando, good to see you. Joe from Tennessee, how are you doing? Chandra, <coughs> Andres, Juan, Fivas, good to see everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I'm in Boston right now. It's snowing a lot. It's very, very white out there. It's kind of cold. Um, so it's going to be a cozy weekend uh, of reading and writing and doing fun stuff. And, um, and I want to take this chance also to send all my love, all my warmth and express my solidarity with Ukraine. I am very dismayed and very sad about what is going on and what the situation I cannot believe that in 2022 we are still de declaring war on each other and um, we are being so reckless about the lives of people I cannot believe this we are still doing these things in the world so if you're watching this from Ukraine please take all my love and all my respect and all my solidarity and I hope I don't know what I hope. I just hope that things go well, or I, I don't even know what to say about this. Anyway, just throwing that out there. Um, uh, yeah, I'm actually quite affected by that whole situation, if you ask me. I, I really cannot understand these things are still happening in the world. Anyway, um, so what are we doing today? Well, um, I have a couple announcements. First of all, we are going to go back to uh, Advanced Development in Grasshopper, that playlist that we've been working on. We actually, we've been doing that for a while already. We're going to finally move on to the last stage of this playlist, which is going to be the development of native plugins. So we're going to start talking today about Visual Studio, about what a plugin looks like, etc., etc., and how to create our own stuff. So that's going to be one thing. Second thing is, I already announced, so this is live stream number 97, according to my records, which means that in three live streams, we will be celebrating the 100th live stream. How awesome is that? Huh? We've, been, we've done that this a hundred times, <laughs> at least. That's pretty awesome. So I was actually hoping to do something special for that 100th anniversary. And I already had an idea, so I am preparing something very special for that um, for that uh, live stream. It's going to um, it's going to involve it's it's going to be super cool. It's going to be tied to the playlist that we're recording, but it's going to be kind of an event in itself, and we're going to have guests, and it's going to be very very awesome. So please mark your calendars for March eighteenth the 100th live stream of Parametric Camp <laughs> because it's going to be very awesome and super, super fun. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so that's another thing. And um, any comments, suggestions, anything from the audience? 
people in the chat, uh, people on Discord. Is anyone writing on Discord right now? We have some questions on Discord. Oh, yes, I forgot to say that. And if you also want to be part of the ongoing conversation throughout the week in between live streams, you are more than welcome to join our Discord server. And there's a link to that server on the description of this video right now. Beautiful. And I'm recording everything and the sound is working and my batteries are working. OK, so that's good. So I think we're ready to start. Um, and what are we doing today? So I have, I'm checking my list here. So we're going to record the first video on native plugin development in Grasshopper. Let me just show the, um, yeah, let me just show the, oh, well, well, let me sit down first. <laughs> and let me show, all right. Where are we? Here. There we are. So, Okay, so blah, 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 blah. this was the curriculum that we wrote together. So um, there was this video here. We started with the basic concepts, why native development versus C sharp scripting, reusability. So what is a crossover plugin? Basic plugin develop uh, basic, basic plugin. No, this would be install. A new plugin project is about. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello plugin. And we're going to call this <laughs> as in we're going to just use whatever comes out of the box and installing everything. I wonder, and then our first component, maybe we could record these three videos and maybe the icons. Uh, <laughs> maybe the icons, why not? Maybe we could record these three videos today at least. And I wonder if we want like an intro video, something introduction to native development in Grasshopper or something like that. And what would we say? What would we say in that video? So it would be mostly like a short video saying like, hey, welcome, we're moving to the news section. We're going to do this, but why are we doing this? And perhaps in that video, we talk about these issues, performance, reusability, distribution. Mm. Mm. Yeah, Look, I'm, I feel like I feel like that's a good idea. So let's do that. So we're going to move on to 5.0 or whatever. Intro to native development. And then here. We're going to do Um, grasshopper components are all, all native and uh, put for Rhino package package manager. Um, con contribute to the community if open source. Uh, community contributions. I want to say that as well. If open source, then you teach other people as well, which is great. Um, I think I would like to say something around that. Okay, so we're going to do that. And in order to do that, I am going to fire here some Rhino. I'm going to open some Rhino. And some grasshopper and uh, and I'm going to show like a few plugins here. Okay, so that's going to be one thing that I show. The other thing probably is going to be Good for Rhino. <clears throat> and there's going to be apps for Rhino and Grasshopper. Okay. We can do that. We can do that. Good for Rhino. What else? 
Grasshopper component uh, package manager. How do I say? Package manager. Uh huh. Okay. And then an example of a nice example of an open source plugin. Uh, hi, Timothy. How you doing? Yes, Dali. This is currently being recorded right now and will stay in the channel forever. And then as soon as we do the video, the video will be posted as a video and its own uh, on the channel. So community. Con so what is a nice plugin that is open source? Well, uh, Machina is open source, but I kind of don't like being so like, hey, look at my plugin, you know? <laughs> uh, maybe Jace one. Jace one is open source. We could, could we do that. Hologram is not open. Vengesh is open source. Compass is open source. Dynamic tools. Xbox for grass elk. Is elk open source? I forget. Compass fab. Let's do Jace one, for example, by Andrew. Where is where is mm -mm -mm. okay and then website oh and your human yeah okay all right all right mm-hmm Okay, so, so I think perhaps then what I want to do is I want to start with this. I want to start with this and I want to say like, hey, this is the beginning, blah, 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 whatever. But why are we doing this? Well, as we saw, actually, let me pull out my the previous oh let me pull up the files that we use for the previous example where we talk about performance because that's an interesting yes Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so mm -hmm. we're going to talk about performance and then Grasshopper components are native, they're compiled, you get performance, it's much more reusable, you kind of create a language. It's interesting because you can create a language and we'll talk about this, about that. Um, an API of actions. That's kind of cool. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So we're going to do that. So let's just jump in then. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do this. And then I'm going to switch to, and I'm going to be doing this side here, as opposed to the previous sides, which, uh, yeah, we were talking before about which side is better or worse to be on. And I've been doing, I've been switching actually. So I'm going to switch back to this one because when we go into Visual Studio, I probably want to be on this end rather than on the other end. So I'm going to stay here. Yes. Beautiful. Okay, so let's start. Re let's record. <clears throat> Hi, this is Jose Luis at Parametric Camp and welcome to a new section in this playlist uh, that we're recording advanced development in Grasshopper. In this new section, 
I would like to now transition from everything that we've done before, which has been writing our own code in C Sharp script components, or in other words, use components in Grasshopper that allow us to customize the code inside of them. And I would like to teach you how to transition to writing your own native C Sharp based plugins for Grasshopper. And but why do we even want to do that in the first place? Why not just stick to c -sharp scripting as we have been? <laughs> and I chose the wrong button. No, OK, we're starting over again, starting over again. <laughs> I fade myself. I faded myself out <laughs> instead, of, instead of doing this, which is what I wanted to do. <laughs> OK, so let's start over again, starting over again, starting over again. Hello, this is Jose Luis at Parametric Camp and welcome to a new section in this playlist, this seminar, this course, however you want to call it, Advanced Development in Grasshopper. What I would like to do now is I would like to transition from everything that we have learned in the previous videos, writing C Sharp code inside script components in Grasshopper, and I would like to teach you how to move farther and supersede that model and start developing your own plugins for Grasshopper, still using the C-sharp programming language. But why do we even want to do that? Why not just stick to C-sharp scripting within Grasshopper? Well, as we have discussed in previous videos, there are, you know, like uh, some advantages in terms of performance instead of um, things that can execute fast, faster, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Moreover, if you're actually serious about the idea of creating your own tools or creating uh, blocks of code that have a certain function that can be reused and that can actually be interconnected with other components, then um, being able to bundle and to package these functional units that you are designing into native plugins that you can share with other people, that you can redistribute, that you can open source, etc. It actually has a lot of advantages in the long, in the long term. Uh, we have seen, for example, how Grasshopper native components are actually bundled and compiled and have their own icons and they have like special functionality. You can mess with the UI, etc., etc. But the idea that you can, instead of just sticking to Grasshopper components, you can bundle your own custom functionality into this idea of plugins, like for example, Machina, which is a plugin that I happen to develop myself, or many other popular plugins like Firefly, Pufferfish, JSON, MetaHopper, like all these other, it has like a lot of advantages because at the end of the day, it's a really interesting computational design exercise because if you think about this, by designing individual functional units that can be combined into more complex operations or what we sometimes call algorithms, right? Uh, designing that and creating your own language of actions or your own application interface for the design of more complex algorithms is actually a super interesting design exercise. It's a great contribution if you're working in a team where you are the one who is developing tools for your team members, or if you want to contribute back to the community and put your code and your tools out there in the wild for other people to use, Grasshopper native components add kind of a really good way of packaging that knowledge and sharing it with the world. It's very typically what is done nowadays as of the recording of this video with Grasshopper, for example. When we go to Food for Rhino, most of what you can find here is as like, for example, Pufferfish, which is one of the most popular um, Grasshopper plugins these days. One Pufferfish is compiled as a set of 330 native components that you can load into your um, Grasshopper and that give you like all this new functionality, all these new possibilities and arguably by contributing your own plugins to the community, you're basically expanding and you're basically helping other people enhance and expand their tool set of possible contributions that they can do to design themselves. So it's a very, very nice practice. Uh, you can also download from, you can download, you can also share your plugins and distribute them through this 
thing that is under very heavily under development and getting more popular as of the recording of this video, the package manager. And if you're even more committed to open contributions and to sharing your work with the world, you can even go the route of taking this code and sharing it as a open source so that other people can pick up your contribution, your plugin, and then make corrections, make amendments, increase the functionality, fix bugs, etc., etc. all the stuff that we do in the open source world. And all of this is better and it's more possible when we work with um, projects that are actually compiled plugins for Grasshopper. So what I'm going to do in this block of videos is I'm going to teach you from scratch how to create a template for a Grasshopper plugin, how to write code that runs inside of these components that we can create, and how to translate a lot of the logics that we have seen in the previous C Sharp scripting videos, how those translate to native development. And by the end of this blog, I will also teach you new things or special things that you can do while developing native plugins as opposed to using c -sharp scripting and maybe probably i think we will wrap up this series with like perhaps more high level ideas or a conversation about what designing a plugin in itself what designing these individual units these individual functional units that we can combine into algorithms what it takes what considerations we can have when thinking about this design process anything that means creating your own library of code that you share with others has a lot of interesting design implications about how do we think about other people using our tools, which is very, very interesting. I like the topic a lot myself. So I hope to do a good job in teaching you through this journey. And without further ado, let's dive into the next video um, and start getting our hands, blah, 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 start getting our hands dirty into uh, creating native grasshopper plugins. All right. Thank you very much. And if you like what you're seeing so far, maybe like this video, subscribe to the channel, say hi, join Discord, whatever, whatever you feel called to do. All right. See you in the next video. Bye bye. All right. Beautiful. Okay, so we'll, let's go back to Parametric Camp. All right, and then what are we doing next? Okay. The next video is going to be, well, let me first close all the stuff that we have here. Um, the next video is going to be basic concept. So what is a Grasshopper plugin? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I did I install voxel tools. Paneling uh, mm -mm, tools. Okay. All right. All right. I'm going to. Okay. Uninstall. All right. And I'm going to wait. Well, I'll show you. You can't see what I'm doing. Oops, I forgot. All right. So the next video we're going to do is I'm going to explain what a Grasshopper plugin is in the first place and how it's different from a C Sharp script or a Visual Studio project, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, <clears throat> so that's here. And then that's probably going to be removed as I restart. So I I just removed a Grasshopper plugin that I had. Um, okay, and then, okay, so I just removed panel in tools, which is the one that I'm going to install as an example. And, and then I'm, I will install voxel tools, probably. Uh, can I install voxel tools? Uh, where where was my Firefox here? So um, voxel 
tools, a grasshopper. But for that, I actually need to remove it first. Because, 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 because yep, I actually, yeah. So I actually have it. And for that, I'm going to need to go where? I need, okay. I should start preparing for these things a bit ahead of time. <laughs> okay. And then in the special components folder. Okay. And so I have voxel tools here. So I'm going to delete this. Okay. So that's one thing. That's the other thing. Okay, and so I'm going to, for the video, I would like to install first a plugin from the package manager, then go to the file and show what we have. And then I'm going to do it manually. I, I, I'm not going to do, no, I'm not going to do voxel tools because voxel tools comes with a DLL. And I don't want to get into the idea of a grasshopper thing with a DLL file. It's a little too much for the beginning. So it might be confusing. So what can I install that, 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 that what can I install? What about robots by Vicente? Well, I can't believe they just released today. <laughs> they had a new release today. Wow, that's great. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe does this come with uh, no, nah, this, this is not even downloadable. So nope. What else? Which one? Um, which plugin do you know of that is just the grasshopper, the GHA file? Pufferfish? What about Pufferfish? Uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. Pufferfish is actually, it works like that, actually, I think, as far as I can tell from what I have on my end. So um, if I un, so Pufferfish 3.0, it has blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we're going to do this. We're going to install Pufferfish. Okay, so we can do that. <clears throat> and what else? Do I need this? No. Um, you guys with a plugin. Server, a Visual Studio project with a plugin to the Okay. Like, and then maybe I can show Machina, for example. I wonder, I mean I can show the project. Uh, no, this is not Grasshopper, sorry. Uh, I want Machina for Grasshopper. And let me turn off Dropbox. Mm -hmm. And then some, for example, Create a robot, display a program, compile a program. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Wow, it's snowing a lot right now here in Boston. Okay, so I can, I can probably, I can probably do this. Um, so we have this, what else? We have this, 
and we have this. Okay. We could do food for rhino, puffer fish. Okay. And okay, so I think. No, okay, so let me. St okay, so let me then start. Okay. So let me then start. <clears throat> Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's do this. Hi, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp, and welcome to another video in our series Advanced Development in Grasshopper. In this video, I would like to start from the beginning and then ask ourselves the question, what is a Grasshopper plugin in the first place? So what kind of code is that? How do we turn code into a plugin? Like that, what, what, how do we connect all these dots together? Well, um, it's going to take us a few videos to unpack this, but for the time being, I would like you to think of a Grasshopper plugin as a collection of C Sharp code to start with that has a particular format and that has a particular way that you need to write this code in so that we can compile it into what becomes a file that then we can drop into our Rhino and Grasshopper environment. And then it somehow, because of that conven those conventions, those templates, those standards, it becomes a component and becomes a plugin that we can use in Grasshopper, okay? How that process works, we're going to see it across these videos. But um, the basic idea is that if you want to first use a plugin, there are, as of the recording of this video, uh, which is, what are we? This is February 2022. As of the recording of this video, there is two main ways to do that. One of them is you can open right now and you can just, you can just type package manager. And then this window will pop up, which allows you to both install new packages for Rhino and for Grasshopper, both things. So for example, if I type here paneling tools, uh, you can see that paneling tools here is a plugin for Rhino and Grasshopper to build blah, 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 right? So I can click on installs and then Rhino has now connected to the database and it has downloaded whatever files it needs to make this work. And if I now open Rhino again and I open Grasshopper on the side and go to here, P, you can see that all of a sudden I have this new plugin that uh, gives me all these new components that were not available on my Grasshopper before and then now give me all this new functionality. But what has happened in the background? What has been downloaded, etc., etc.? Well, if I go to this route, so this will look something like typically in your Windows machine, it will look something like users and then the name of your user, in my case, JLX, and then application data, Roomy, McNeil, Rhinoceros, and packages. If you go to this, then you can see that inside of the, in my case, 7.0, the Rhino version that I was working with, I now have paneling tools installed as part of the packages that are available for my Rhino. Right. Before I used to have Parachute, that's the one that I use for displaying this tiny uh, helper text here to, for the icons. And if I go inside of paneling tools, you can see that there's a bunch of files here that somehow conform my Grasshopper plugin. All right. We will take a closer look at this file, which is the main file for Grasshopper plugins, the GHA file. The other ones, are other things that come with paneling tools because paneling tools also has a Rhino package in itself and it has this DLL files, which is code that supports the functionality of both. So it's a little um, 
this one example is a little more complicated, right? Before Package Manager, the way we used to download and install packages used to be through the main repository of contributions in the Rhino community, which as of this recording is still called Food for Rhino. If you're watching this in the far distant future, maybe Food for Rhino is now obsolete and you're only using the package manager. But as of right now, we're kind of still transitioning between the two. So it's still very popular to go to Food for Rhino and look for some plugin that you like, for example, Machina, which is this plugin that I developed myself, or one of the most popular ones, for example, Pufferfish, right? So let's say we want to download and install Pufferfish. How does that work? Well, I go to Pufferfish in Food for Rhino. If it loads, which is not loading, give me a second. Why is it not loading? Is the Rhino website down? What's going on? Can you see me? <laughs> Am I connected to the internet? <laughs> wow, is, is internet gone? No, it's not. I can't believe Food for Rhino just broke right now. Am I, are we serious? So let me open a different browser. <laughs> Seriously? I can't believe the page just went down <laughs> as I was recording this. I can't believe that. This is ridiculous. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Seriously, what are the odds that I'm recording this and it worked five minutes ago and it doesn't work now? <laughs> oh boy, this is what happens when you do things live. Okay, could we give it a few? Yeah, I see. Yeah, it's not working for anyone, huh? Okay, well, I guess things are not working. I wonder, what do we do now? Should we wait? Should we move on to the next video and come back? Can we do this without being connected? Seriously, what a disaster. Okay, let me think about this. So what is, what else did I, did I want to do? And stupid Firefox doesn't tell me that the page is down. That's, that's not very cool. The network, the request is a 503. Huh. That sucks. Oh, <laughs> it just got back. Okay. Is it working for folks now? Is it working on your end? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So let's keep recording before it goes down. Okay. Well, you're not going to believe that, but as I was recording the video, the page literally went down for five minutes. So now it's back. So let me do this real quick before it, we lose it again. So you click on the component, um, the plugin that you want to download, right? And provided that you are registered and logged into the page, etc., you can go down here to all the different versions and you can download a zip file that I'm going to save somewhere on my desktop. Okay, so I'm going to put that on my desktop and then uh, you can see that this is going to show up here. And <clears throat> if I extract it here to Pufferfish, blah, 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 you can see that if I click inside, there is basically this main 
GHA file, the Grasshopper um, A file. I don't know what A stands for. Um, Mike Pryor has put here some in instructions on how to install this. Basically, the way you install this, again, if you're looking this at, if you look watching this from the future, maybe this sounds like super like a troglodyte prehistoric. But you go to Grasshopper, you go to Files, you go to Special Folders, and you go to Components Folder. And here, in my case, I already have a bunch of um, previous plugins installed. So what you do is you basically take all these files, and then I'm going to I'm going to actually copy the thing with the with the folder itself. So I'm going to go the whole Pufferfish 3.0, and I'm just going to drop it here. And something that you need to do is you also need to right click on the GH file and make sure that you have no blocked check mark anywhere here. Because when you download files from the internet with Windows, then Windows flags them as unsafe and it blocks them from executing. Um, so sometimes you need to manually undo that. Then you restart, you can restart your Rhino and your Grasshopper, you have to restart it. And then once you do that, then you can see that now Pufferfish is showing up here on my on my um, is showing up here on my Grasshopper. All right. So what that means is that somehow there is a way to create these GHA files, and uh, once you create that file, then making it available in your Rhino environment either via the package manager as we did with paneling tools or by manually downloading it and putting it in a special folder called libraries. Either those two ways, for some reason, makes Grasshopper realize that there's this new repository of code that shall be loaded and displayed here on your screen. But how do we even do, how do we even uh, create that GHA file in the first place? Well, uh, surprise, surprise, we're going to do that by writing our own C -sharp code. And it turns out that, as we will see in the next video, uh, Grasshopper plugins are basically a collection of code that is inheriting from a set of classes and a set of special code that is available inside of the Grasshopper Software Development Kit, the SDK. We've seen some of that in previous videos. And then the way we build Grasshopper plugins is by taking those pre, um, those template classes, if you will, subclassing them or extending them with our own versions, and then overriding some of the properties that make those components work. So for example, this in this case, this is the code of the Machina plugin that I develop in my free time when I can spend some time doing this. And this is specifically the Grasshopper plugin that uses Machina and that allows us to work in Grasshopper. So you can see that the source code, there is a main uh, assembly that has the information about the plugin itself. But then in order to, for example, have the robot create or the robot version or the logger, those components, the robot create, is a component that has basically subclasses from this generic Grasshopper component that has a bunch of overrides. So we have to write specific parts of code in a specific basis. We're going to see all of this, right? And then as soon as I and this is, for example, the compiler program that the code is a bit more involved, etc. But it's quite simple still anyway. And as soon as we have all of this and all the components that we liked as part of our project, what we can do is we can compile this, turn it into that Grasshopper H file, and then load it into our Grasshopper environment. Okay. Now, how does that look? We're going to see it on the next few videos, but. Uh, Long, um, surprise, surprise, in order to follow the next videos, what I'm going to ask from you is that you get some familiarity with writing C sharp code inside of Visual Studio, which is this environment that I'm showing here, and which is the one that we're going to be using for development. So if you if you know how to write C sharp code, and you've used Visual Studio a couple times, then you are probably on a good position to start learning from what I'm going to be showing in the next videos. Otherwise, if you don't know how to write C sharp, 
then you're probably not in this video anyway because we've done it so much in the previous examples. But if you want to get a bit more familiarity with Visual Studio, then I recommend you go to my other playlist, Learning C Sharp, and there's a bunch of videos on Visual Studio, how Visual Studio works, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I recommend that you <coughs> check them out. They're going to show up somewhere over here as a card, and there will be links in the description of this video. Okay, beautiful. So without further ado, let's move on to the next video where we're going to write our first simple plugin. Oh, and I'm going to teach you how to install the templates and the basic code to run Grasshopper plugins in Grasshopper. Okay. If you like this video, maybe hit the thumbs up button, maybe join the channel, maybe um, subscribe to the channel, whatever you want. All right. See you in the next video. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Said. Yep. I was about to forget that and I didn't. <laughs> okay. So now I'm going to shut everything down. I'm going to shut this down, all the folders, etc., etc. I should have moved them somewhere else. And I'm going to remove the extensions that I have for this. I'm going to uninstall this because I would like to install it with all of us. All right. I'm going to, yes. I'm going to uninstall my templates and I'm going to install them together with, uh, with all of you. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Beautiful. So what is the next thing we're going to do? Uh, do I have Visual Studio as an icon? Uh, what is this? Visual Studio, can I create send to desktop create a shortcut? There you go. Okay, so I'm going to drop this here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, and then I'm going to show the playlist. I'm going to show the playlist. Um, ah, Dan, look, we're live. <laughs> Can you see how I like diving and nature documentaries? <laughs> it's very obvious, right? Uh, okay. Yeah. What, are, what, are, what was I going to do? Yes. The channel, I want to show the playlist, learning C sharp, how to install Visual Studio, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. All right. So in this video, what are we going to do? How to install Visual Studio? Uh, um, install Visual Studio. Okay, so that's one thing. And then install the templates. We're going to do that together. And then we're going to start a new plugin template project. Use the boilerplate. Just build whatever. And uh, 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 okay. And then I would like to. I'm going to need to show how to build and how to link this. This. So I would like to then. I would like to then just link to the library, okay, so that we can do uh, development. All right. Okay. <clears throat> mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so then let's get started. Hello, this is Hossel Luis. Well, Hossel Luis? Did I say Hossel Luis? <laughs> All right, I'm starting over again. Oh, Luciano, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, okay, starting over again.
Um, mm -mm -mm. Hi, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp, and welcome to a new video where we're going to do our we're going to write our first Grasshopper plugin. Yay! Are you not excited? Uh, I'm going to call this video Hello Grasshopper plugin. Okay, I kind of like that. <laughs> as a homage to the Hello World program that we typically learn when we get introduced to a new programming language. So what are we going to do? The way we're going to do that is that in this video, I'm going to teach you how to install Visual Studio. Well, I'm actually not going to do that, but I'll get to that in a second. I'm going to teach you how to install the templates that we use to start Grasshopper plugins in a fast way. And then um, I'm going to teach you how to compile that Grasshopper plugin and load it in Rhino and create a development workflow so that we can change code and fire Rhino a bit faster, et cetera, et cetera, and get ourselves ready with a template to then be able to start writing our new components from scratch in the next videos, all right? So first of all, what do you need in order to do this? First of all, you're going to need Visual Studio, all right? Visual Studio, as you probably already know, is the most popular development environment for C-sharp based code for Windows applications. Uh, it's the programming environment that we're going to be using for Grasshopper development. And uh, it's different, Visual Studio is different from Visual Studio Code, which is a very similar environment, but that one is actually much more oriented to other programming languages. So my recommendation for you is that you use Visual Studio I'm going to be using an old 2019 version, but you can download the most recent community version, okay? And uh, I'm actually going to assume for these videos that you are slightly familiar with the Visual Studio environment. If you only used it one or twice, it's fine. You can probably follow up. But if you don't, I would like to recommend that you perhaps take a closer look at the videos that I have in my other playlist learning C Sharp, all right? And then specifically, you take a look at how to install Visual Studio and take a general look at the Visual Studio interface and how to, and maybe you want to do the Hello World program also to get, um, to get comfortable with Visual Studio, all right? So cards with links to this playlist will be popping up somewhere here on the video and there will be a description, a link in the description of this video. So once you have Visual Studio on your system, I'm going to double click and I would like you to ask, I would like to ask you to turn it to fire it, all right? And um, as opposed to typically starting a project, what I would like to do is I'm going to start Visual Studio without any code. I'm not going to load any program. I'm going to start a blank, empty Visual Studio, which arguably is quite useless. But we're doing this because what we want is first install the tools in Visual Studio that will help us kickstart Grasshopper plugin projects. We're going to do that by going to extensions, manage extensions, and extensions is very similar to actually the package manager that I've shown before in my previous video for the Rhino, right? It's this thing that you can go and then you can download these packages that enhance and give you extra features to how Visual Studio works. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to go to manage extensions online and I'm going to search here for Rhino. Let's see what let's see what shows up. And we can see that already we have a few options here. Rhino common templates, Rhino common grasshopper templates for version six. This is from previous versions where downloading stuff for Rhino and for Grasshopper were two different templates. Now for version seven, they have unified everything in one template. So I'm going to go to the Rhino common and grasshopper templates for Rhino seven. And I'm going to download this package, okay? I'm going to close, restart Visual Studio. And then as I do, the package with all these templates will get started. So I click modify and everything starts, etc., etc. <coughs> and this will effectively load all these templates and all these tools in my Visual Studio installation that will help me kickstart Rhino Common, Grasshopper, and many other Rhino related projects like plugin, Rhino plugins, Rhino commands, a lot of interesting stuff. So now if I do that, as I install, as I run Visual Studio, uh, when I say create a new project, because of that template, now all of a sudden I have this new set of possibilities that I did not have before I installed the extension. 
What this is going to be is that Rhino and Grasshopper, what they give us is basically template projects with all the infrastructure and all the setup and a couple basic examples of how to write a Grasshopper plugin that are very useful for us to accelerate and get us kickstarted really fast. Because then the only thing we need to do is just go in, change some of the names, change some of the code and start writing our own plugin. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a new Grasshopper assembly for Rhino 7 in C Sharp. You can actually write Grasshopper plugins in Visual Basic, but it's 2022. I'm not sure why would anyone do that. <laughs> I'm sure David Rotten has a lot of opinions about that, which I would actually be very interested in, in hearing. But Visual Basic is a programming language that uh, it's kind of falling in this in not using this use or however the word is that. So, and since we've already learned so much C sharp, why not stick to that? So Grasshopper assembly for Rhino 7 in C sharp, and I'm going to click next. I'm going to drop this on my desktop, and then I'm going to call this project Hello Grasshopper plugin. Oops. Hello Grasshopper plugin. Or should I do uh, more? Uh, I mean, let me just call this my first Grasshopper plug plugin. All right. Actually, you know what? Why don't we just do? Why don't we just do it? Let's call this PCamp Grasshopper plugin. Okay, because we're going to just work with this project for the time being. All right. I'm going to click my desktop and I'm going to leave this on Play Solution and Project in the same directory. That's absolutely fine. All right. So I'm going to create this and all of a sudden I get this menu that asks me for some default information. What does that mean? It means that the template generator is giving me the possibility to order, already populate my project with some boilerplate, with some predetermined code. What that means is that, first of all, I can choose the name of my plugin. I'm going to stick to PCAMP Grasshopper plugin. There's going to be one component class, so one base class that I'm going to be using. I can call this as well. And then my first component can have these names, which we're going to overwrite very soon. Also, I'm going to click here on provide sample code because I would like the template to generate two components so that I can see already that something is working and that I get something on Grasshopper and on Rhino, right? And last but not least, the template is probably going to do a good job at figuring out where your local Rhino installation is, which in my case, it's this one, all right? But if it's not, make sure that you browse here and then you find where in your system your Rhino 7 lives, because this will be very helpful when we start developing in Visual Studio and we say, can I try running this Grasshopper plugin? And then Visual Studio will start Rhino on your behalf with the component already loaded and with a system that will allow us to debug the code. So I'm going to finish that. And now the template generator is creating the project on my behalf. And it's actually, let me drop, let me move this here, PCAM, Grasshopper plugin, etc. And you can see that um, I already have stuff here. So you can see that, for example, I have a project that has two main C sharp files. It has the PCAMP Grasshopper plugin info, and then it has this PCAMP Grasshopper plugin component. All right. Now, when we will get more into the details of what this is, but for the time being, just let's keep in mind that the plugin info component is basically code that tells the plugin what version of the plugin it is, whether if it should have an icon who is the author, it's, met, it's basically metadata that is useful for other plugins to know each other, for Grasshopper to know how to handle plugins together. And if you're posting this on a package manager to have additional data about what this plugin is about. And then there is this also file that is called the PCAM Grasshopper plugin component, which is already this boilerplate, this sample code of some code running something. In this case, you can see that we can read that it's going to create this spiral given the radius and the number, whatever. And you can see that we already have some code here in this register input parameters, output parameters, solve instance. I don't really know what any of that is. 
there's another file here. I have no idea what any of this means, but we will see what all this means in further videos. But what I want now is since we actually have a plugin with a one component, I would actually like to see if this runs and where, how can I run this code inside of Grasshopper? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to keep debug as an option and I'm going to hit pcamp Grasshopper plugin. I'm going to run this Visual Studio project. And you can see that immediately Rhino is, and you can see that Visual Studio opened my Rhino installation. That's because the path and the link, the, that's because the path in the template generator was correct. If this is not working for you, it's because Visual Studio cannot find where Rhino lives on your system. And then as I open Grasshopper, what I would expect to happen is for this new component that I have created to show up as a plugin, all right? That is not what's going to happen because first of all, uh, for reasons that we will see very soon, this component was not designed to be a standalone plugin, but it's, this component was designed to actually live inside of the curve category and inside of the primitive tab or vice versa. So I, in order, instead of an actual standalone plugin, where that component lives is in curves and it's in primitives, okay? So this is what I should find this component. However, I can't find it right now. You see, it's not anywhere to be found uh, as far as I can tell, I believe. It's nowhere to be found because um, the way the project is set up is to be able to compile the, the Grasshopper plugin, but the project right now is not placing that Grasshopper file in anywhere that the Rhino environment can read, okay? So let's do, let's see how we can fix that. So first of all, I'm going to close, I'm going to close Rhino. I'm going to go to my project. I'm going to go to binaries to debug net 48. And you can see that Inside of my project in binary debug net 48, you can see that I have this GHA file that we have seen in previous plugins and this PDB that is a debug file that it's, um, we don't really need that uh, for right now. But this Grasshopper file is the plugin that I want and it's a file that contains the code for my plugin. However, because this file is in this folder, pcom plugin on my desktop, blah, blah, blah. Right now, it's not able to see it. It's not able to figure out that there is a library here that it should load in its environment. So what we need to do is we need to take this file and load it into our Grasshopper libraries uh, folder, which I kind of forget what it is. So I'm, I've, I don't know what it is. So I'm going to go to, I could go to Grasshopper files, whatever, but I also, can, do, can go here on the command line, grasshopper folders, and then hit on components. And then that will open immediately my, uh, that will open immediately my grasshopper libraries. So I can open here a new folder and say, pcamp plugin test, for example, I can copy this thing here and then I can drop it here. And then if I restart my Rhino environment, let me show you if I restart my Rhino environment. If I restart my Rhino environment and open Grasshopper, hopefully. Oh, okay. So we can see that uh, this is not going to work <coughs> because, oh, I didn't expect this to happen. Because the version of Rhino that I'm using is actually older, so the version of the Rhino common library 7.7 .7, is older than the version of the template generator that was downloaded with the extension, which in this case is 7.13. So if I do that, that was an interesting error. Uh, and I go to curves primitives, you can see that I still don't see that component anywhere here. All right, so okay. So let's go back then. So there's two ways then that you can solve this one. You can update Rhino <laughs> so that you have a more modern version of Rhino common, or you can go into your Visual Studio project with the plugin and you can downgrade 
the version of the Grasshopper SDK that you're using for this project. This is actually much more advanced than I expected for this video, but since we're here, why not? So I'm going to go to dependencies, I'm going to go to packages, and I'm going to go to Grasshopper. And you can see that the version of Rhino common is 7.13, or the version of the Grasshopper API. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to click on Update. You can see that I open the Package Manager. And if I click on the Package Manager, you can see that the Grasshopper plugin that I'm seeing, actually, I can even upgrade it to a much more modern version, 7.15. However, what I actually want to do is I want to downgrade it to whichever version I had on my Rhino. So what I want to do is I want to downgrade it from 7.13 to 7.7, .7, which is my version of Rhino. So I'm going to update that. I'm going to make all these changes. So Rhino Common and Grasshopper are going to go down in version, etc., etc. So that's fine now. You can see that my package is now 7.7, .7, which matches what I had in Rhino. And I'm going to now do this again. So I'm going to execute the, the, the project, which loads, which fires, which starts Rhino, and which if I now start Grasshopper, I'm going to have the same problem. I still have the same error here, exactly. Why is that? Because this Rhino, this is confusing at the beginning, this Rhino that I just started from Visual Studio is not loading the more modern version of the plugin that I just compiled in the background, but it's still loading this file that I copy pasted into the libraries folder. Okay, I'm going to explain how to fix this in a second. So how would I have to fix this? Well, I would have to delete from the folder the old Grasshopper version that I created. I will need to go back to my project to the binary debug net 48 then take this file then copy it again then drop it here in the library so that i update it with the most modern version and then if i now run if i now execute rhino you can already see how tired and how tedious this process is and if i now execute rhino and i launch grasshopper grasshopper has now been loaded with the correct file the updated one and if I go to curves, primitives, ta -da! can you see this? Woohoo! We found it. So my pcamp grasshopper plugin, which if I drop here, is this plugin that takes a plane for creating a spiral that has the inner radius, the outer radius, and some number of turns, and then generates this curve, which is a spiral. And then, of course, I can control this and then more turns, less turns, whatever. It's sample code that David Rotten made available for us as an example of how to write a, a component for a Grasshopper plugin, okay? Beautiful. So this is working. We have some template code. We should be ready to start writing our own components, but the problem is that this process that I've shown you, the idea of write, ch making changes in the code running it again, having to copy the file, etc., is extremely, extremely tedious. No one wants to have to be copying these files all over again every time you change some code and you compile again. That's just not feasible. So what are we going to do then? What I would like to do is find a way to make sure that whenever I hit execute, the Rhino that fires up is loading the updated version of the plugin that I compile whenever I hit this play button, all right? So what am I going to do then? I could do two things. First, maybe what I could do is just write this kind of batch script that whenever I hit play here and I compile a new plugin, it just copies that plugin automatically to here to this folder. But that's kind of a little tedious. There's actually a much simpler way of going about this. The way to go about this is that, first of all, I'm going to remove, I'm going to close, I'm going to remove my plugin, I'm going to remove my plugin from the libraries folder. So the plugin is not going to be there as long as I am developing it, all right? So that's one thing. And the other thing that I would like to do is I would like to make sure that Grasshopper and Rhino not only look at that folder, the libraries folder for plugins, but they also look at special folders that I might be using for development. In this case, this one. What I would like to do is I would like to tell Rhino, hey, 
uh, look for plugins in your default folders, but also look for plugins in this one folder that I have in my desktop, which is the one that I'm going to be constantly updating with my plugin. The way to do that is you can go here and say Grasshopper Developer Settings, and then this window pops up. In this window, you can see that you can add special library folders for Grasshopper to take a look at before loading anything. So what I can do here is I can add to this list by pressing an add folder, I can add this copy pasted route of desktop, my project folder, binaries, debug, net 48. And then so that whenever Grasshopper opens up, it it looks at all the folders that you have here and it loads libraries from those folders as well. What is that going to result in? So let me close everything, all right? And let me make sure I'm going to delete this from so that we know that we're starting from scratch. So for example, let's say that I'm going to, um, I'm going to change the name of the component. I'm going to call it Hello PCamp, for example, all right? Uh, and the description is going to be Hello P campers, for example. All right, I'm going to save this and I'm going to hit execute, which will, first of all, it will rebuild the plugin, it will create a new version of the plugin, and then it will open Rhino. As we open Rhino and I open Grasshopper, what you will see is that Grasshopper now has taken a look at this folder and then has picked up this new library that has shown up. So if I go to curves and if I go to primitives, you can see how the component has now changed in name and now it's not called PCAM Grasshopper plugin, whatever it's called Hello PCAM. So it has these changes that are just implemented and in the description it says Hello PCAMPers. All right. Beautiful. So this, what this will let us do is have a more integrated and more fluid development environment where any changes that I do now to the code, I can save them. I can now I can start restart the project, a new Rhino will open up, a new updated version of the library will load in Grasshopper, and then we can see the changes immediately. All right, so I can now see that the description text has changed to hello, blah, 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 blah. all right. But this integrated development will also have advantages very soon as soon as we start getting into how to create breakpoints and how to stop the execution of right now and how to look at the evolution of the program, okay? Which we will do in further videos down the road. So I believe this is everything I wanted to say for this video. So now that we know how to start an empty Grasshopper plugin project, and we know how to link it to Rhino so that we have a fluid development environment, I think we are now ready to actually start writing our first component from scratch and take a look at what all this crazy blah, 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 what this is, register input parameters, outputs, the solve instance, what all this craziness, what this means, all right? So let's get hands on and let's take a look at how to do that in the next video. And in the meantime, maybe consider liking this video, uh, hitting subscribe, turning on notifications, saying hi in the comments, whatever you please. Okay. Thank you and see you on the next video. Bye bye. All right. Beautiful. Ooh, how are we doing? Oh, my little, can I go get some water? Yeah, because I don't want to drink another coffee because it's I, it's been a lot already. So <laughs> let me go and drink some water. Give me one minute. I'll be back and then we're going to get into writing our first component from scratch. Okay, um, which is what component is that going to be? I guess we're just going to add a couple numbers or something. Butter chicken. <laughs> that is an amazing nickname. Mr. Butter Chicken. I actually like butter chicken a lot. Uh, <laughs> all right. See you in one minute. Let me go get a glass of water. I'll be right back.
All right. Welcome back. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Also, in case you were worried, um, in case you were worried, <clears throat> um, in case you were worried, I just bought rechargeable batteries for these guys. <laughs> so now I feel much better because I'm not using like hundreds of batteries every month or every year. I don't know. It was a lot of waste. Okay, next video. <clears throat> Our first component from scratch. We're going to add two numbers. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're going to add two numbers, which is going to be great, right? Uh, and the way we're going to do that is that, um, how are we going to do that? Should I remove my grasshopper plugin component? And should I... <clears throat> Um. Uh, um. Hmm. Okay. So I wonder if I want to delete the plugin component and we want to start from scratch. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Maybe instead of deleting it, I can just hide it. Exposure, I can just, yeah. Um, yeah, why not? <clears throat> Maybe we can do that. And then what we are going to do is just create a new item, which is going to be Rhino empty grasshopper component, uh, add component, for example. <clears throat> Addition components, we can do that. And then as we do that, add the component, the nickname, my description, the category, <coughs> description, uh, solve instance, the icon, and the component ID, and the exposure. And how are we going to explain this story? Hmm, an exposure, and we can do a couple examples here. We can add two numbers or we can create a vector. Oh, break mode. We're going to see that, Andres. It means stopping the SQ. Do I have that somewhere? Custom version of external library testing and debugging. Yes, we will have a video on break mode and debugging and testing and all that stuff. Don't worry. Mm. 
<clears throat> and do I want I'm just sorry, I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I'm thinking about how to how to frame this. Our first component. And Okay, so let's just go for it. Why? Well, I, I don't know what I'm thinking so much about this. <clears throat> I'm not going to delete anything. I'm going to keep it on the side. And I'm actually not going to get into exposure. I will get to that by the end of the video. So, yeah. <clears throat> so there's no need to delete anything really right now. It's not on the way. Okay. All right, let's do this. Oh. Hello, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp and welcome to another video in this series, Advanced Development in Grasshopper, where I'm going to teach you finally how to create your first Grasshopper component from scratch, from complete scratch. So in the previous videos, we have seen how to install Visual Studio, install the extensions that generate templates and create a project template for a Grasshopper plugin and link the output of that project dynamically to Rhino loading and uploading the version of the compiled plugin um, immediately. All right. So and for that, we use this sample code, this boilerplate that came with the template generator. All right. So we're going to put this aside for the time being. And what I would like to do now is I would like to teach you how to create a Grasshopper component in this plugin from scratch. What are the parts that we need to take a look at? Where do we write the code? And how do we turn that into an actual component? So let's go step by step. The first thing that I would like to do is I would like to create a new empty template for a Grasshopper component. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to go right click in the main PCAM Grasshopper plugin. I'm going to close this down. I'm going to right click here, click add, and I'm going to add a new item to my project. You can see that uh, if you were to open this from scratch, you would land here in this list of the possible items that you can add to a project that can be files, classes, components, and a bunch of stuff. And if I keep scrolling down, you will see that at some point, you will have the option of adding an empty Grasshopper component for Rhino 7 or whatever, which at the end of the day is just a C sharp file, as you can see in the name editor. But it's a C sharp file that is going to come pre populated with a few overrides and a few sections that will help add, that will make adding code much easier and much faster. So I'm going to start with a very simple example where I'm going to create a component that adds two numbers, like the simplest thing ever. So I'm going to call this add numbers component. When I write Grasshopper uh, plugins, I like adding component to whatever is a component, right? Uh, so I'm going to create this file called add numbers component. 
I'm going to create this and you can see that this new file shows up on my project and that already has a bunch of code here that does absolutely nothing. So the question that we're going to start with is what is a grasshopper component in the first place? Well, a grasshopper component is basically any code that we write subclassing this grasshopper component abstract class that the software, the SDK for Grasshopper gives us as, um, I don't want to use the word template again in this case. It's sort of a template as well, but uh, it's basically a class that forces us, that forces us when we subclass it, when we subclass it to add a few overrides and a few methods that force us to customize the behavior of this one component that we create. But by doing this, the Grasshopper original Grasshopper component class has a lot of functionality inside of itself that we don't need to mess with, which takes care of taking what we're going to write and putting it in the right way and making a box out of it and attaching an icon and all those things that are necessary or the infrastructure to make this component show up on the screen and work when we plug in wires, etc. etc. So what we basically do when we create components is that we create instances of subclassing the grasshopper component class. And actually, if you press F12, uh, oops, sorry. I, if you press F12, you can go to a sort of high level description of all the methods and all the stuff that is already pre-populated and all the code that um, makes these components work, that which we don't need to mess with. But because we have generated this with a template, it's actually really nice because it already gives us empty categories of what's important for us to customize in this component. So the first thing that I would like to highlight is that this is a class, just like any other classes that we have worked with in object-oriented programming. And if you're not familiar with object-oriented programming, I really recommend you check out our videos on object-oriented programming cards will be popping up here in the corner or in the description of this video. And, um, but it's basically instances that are generated by the Grasshopper engine from your, for your component. So every time you drop a new component, a new instance of this numbers component will be generated. The class needs to have a constructor. The constructor is the first part that the template gives us here. And you can see that uh, the constructor has a few things. It basically takes five strings, which determine the name of the component, its description, and where it's going to show up on the screen, all right, on the grasshopper. So let's see, for example, I'm going to keep at numbers, I'm going to remove the component part because this is going to be the name that is going to show up when on my tab when I drop down, all right? The nickname is going to be at nums, for example, because it's typically the version of the name, but a bit shorter. The description is going to be add two numbers together, for example. And then the category and the subcategory is where in my grasshopper this component should show up. If, for example, I were to say here maths and operators, for example, then my component will show up in the default uh, grasshopper native maths and operators categories. Because I'm creating my own plugin, which is going to be new and it's going to have its own tab and its own everything, I probably don't want to do this. What I probably want to do is first of all, come up with a name for my plugin. So I'm going to call this PCAMP. So PCAMP is going to be the name of the plugin. And then <clears throat> the name of the category inside of the plugin is going to be um, operators, I'm going to keep these operators, but I will eventually transition to categories that match this uh, prototype that we have been developing in previous videos in this series. Okay, so I'm going to keep this as uh, operators. <coughs> I would have the option of adding custom code when the component is, is created, but for this one, I don't need to do any of this. There's nothing I need to prepare before adding two numbers. So I'm going to leave this empty. Now, in because this is code, remember when we were working in C-sharp scripting, 
When we wanted to work with the inputs, what we did was we placed the C-sharp script component and then we click add inputs, remove inputs, and we right clicked on this must be a Boolean, this must be a double, et cetera, et cetera. So that we were able to customize the types that were coming into the component. And also if it was an item, a list, a tree, et cetera, et cetera. That we cannot do manually with an UI in here. So we have though a way to do the same thing, but do it with code instead of doing it with the UI. That is what the, these, two, these two functions, register input parameters and register output parameters, what these are meant to do. These are functions that I use to define what is going to go in to the component and what types and what data structures and what is going to come out of this component. And the way that I'm going to do that is by using this argument that the Grasshopper engine gives to the component every time it initializes a new component that is called the P manager or the parameter manager. Think of this as, I don't know, a worker that is given to your component and then you can tell the worker, hey, can you please add an input of a number? Can you please add an input of the type vector? Can you please do this? And then the worker will take care of somehow placing those inputs and giving them the right types on your grasshopper component. Okay, of, of, of sorts. So what does that mean? The P manager object contains a lot of functionality that I can use to create those parameters. So for example, if I say P manager and I type dot, you can see the whole list of add angle, add arc, add boolean, add box, add circle. You can already see all the really cool, uh, all the functions that give me the access to add stuff to the input. And basically they are typed. So because um, I want to add two numbers, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to scroll, I'm going to find add, you see I have add integers, but I don't want integers because I want to be able to add numbers with decimal part. In this case, the way Grasshopper calls this is not a double or a float, it's just add number. So I'm going to add a number and I'm going to open parentheses and you can see that I have three overloads. I'm going to scroll to the most, the, the longest one, all right? And I'm going to scroll to this one. And what this one says is that this component, this function needs five arguments in order to work. It needs the name of the input, it needs a nickname, so a shorter version, the description of this input, and the access to the data structure, whether if it's an item, a list of a data tree. You've seen this already in the c -sharp scripting, and whether if I actually want to add a default value, or if I don't want to use that, then I can just stick to the, to the, um, to the, um, overload that doesn't have that parameter and there's no default parameter. So let's start with the simple add name. I'm going to call, uh, for example, number, number a. All right. And the nickname is going to just be a because it's in grasshopper. Typically nicknames for inputs and outputs are just a capital letter or two. It's just a convention. The description is first value to add, for example, and then when it comes to access, the way we define the access is by using a, a numerator. If you don't know what an enumerator is, please uh, see the video that is going to pop up as a card here in the corner or as a link in the description of this video. So there is the grasshopper gives us the grasshopper parameter access enumerator that when I click dot, I can choose between three types, item, list, or tree. Does this sound familiar to you? Doesn't this look exactly like that right click, choose tree, choose list that we did when inputting data in c -sharp scripting? It's the exact same thing. So for this one, I'm going to choose item, okay? And then I could choose to have a last uh, default value. So I could say, for example, the default value is going to be zero. If no one gives me anything, then just zero. All right, so that was the first one. I want to add a second one. So I'm going to call this one, I'm going to copy paste, call this one B, B, this is going to be the second value to add. And then it's also going to be an item and it's also going to have the value of zero as default. Beautiful. My component already has two inputs. Then 
for the output parameters, it's going to be the exact same thing. So I also have a P manager object that I can use to add a number parameter, which is going to be the result, and the nickname is going to be R, and the description is going to be addition result, for example. And then parameter access is also going to be of the type item. And this one doesn't get any default, uh, any default value. Okay, so we have inputs and outputs, and now how do we connect them? Where do we actually write the code? Where do we write the code is in this third method that we need to overwrite, which is called solving instance. All right, solving instance is very, very similar to the run script method that we had inside C sharp script components. What this does is that it retrieves the data from the inputs. And then here you can write the code to um, work with those data, work with that data, mesh it up, uh, together and um, and do whatever result. Okay. Now, how does this work? The way this works is a uh, it's very grasshopper uh, like uh, I don't know how to say this, but it, it has a it's, it has a very specific pattern. Let's say to how do you have to write the code to retrieve data from the inputs and to output data to the outputs. The way that works is that you are also given this thing called the data object as an argument. Again, think of this as, an, as a worker of sorts that is given to the method and that you can use to access some functionality from the component. In this case, data access is going to be our middle person between our code and retrieving data from the inputs and getting data from the outputs. What that means is that, is that um, we don't have a variable by doing this, we don't really have a variable anywhere that we can use to read the value of number one or number B or whatever that is, there's no such thing. We just added these two inputs, but we don't have where do I access those inputs? Where do I access those inputs is by using da dot get data. So with this, you can the, the da object has a function called get data that allows us to retrieve information from the inputs. And what it needs is, first of all, it needs an index. So which one of the inputs am I reading from? So you can see that because I have two inputs, the first one will be called zero and the second one will be called one. So they, for, I want to get data for the first one. And this component also, what it does is, it doesn't really return that data because that data could have multiple types multiple types. So what it does is it asks us for a reference variable that it can place that data inside of. Okay. Think of this as the out uh, as the out keyword that we use sometimes when we call methods. So what we need now, I'm going to stop here for a second, what we need now is actually a variable that the DA object can take data from the zero input and place it in that variable. For that, I'm going to then define a variable beforehand. I'm going to call this A and I'm going to initialize it to the value of zero, for example. And then here, what I'm going to say is whatever data you get from the input zero, can you please place it on variable A? All right. That's one thing. And then similarly, I'm going to do the same thing for B. I'm going to create a variable B and then I'm going to say data, and whatever is coming in from the index from the parameter in index one can you please place it in the variable B that I just created and with that what I have now is the variable A and B containing the information that is coming as an input all right so I'm going to say define placeholder variables and then load values from inputs into those variables. All right. So now, and then once I have the input values, now I can actually just um, the code that actually does the work. <laughs> so here I can just now write my algorithm, whatever I'm the fantastic code that is going to be running inside of this component. So here is going to be something like the sum is going to be equal a plus b. All right. Beautiful. Now, I have the operation. 
And now I need to find a way to actually output that result from the component. The way this works is that I also use the DA object and I say DA, but instead of get, what I want to do now is set the data, all right? And set data is going to be a function that is going to take the index of the output parameter. We only have one, so that's going to be zero. And then the object, the variable that contains the data that we want to output through that output. So that's going to be, in this case, the variable sum, okay? So yeah, this is a little weird. It's not perhaps what we would have expected, but it's kind of how Grasshopper works internally. You always have to handle yourself how to retrieve the input data, turn it into variables that you can use, and then how to, once you have written your algorithm, how to output that through the component. All right, beautiful. I'm going to save this and then as I run my code, hopefully, let's cross our fingers, we should be able to see that component show up in Grasshopper, okay? So let's do that. Come on, come on. And then wait, 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 have you seen this? I have a new P all the way here. It's called PCAMP, it's my library. And it has this one category called operators and one component called at numbers, oh my God, I can't believe this, choo-hoo. And then it takes A is the first value to add, B is the second value to add, and it has default values, and R is the result of the addition. God, can you believe this? Can you please try? Okay, so I'm going to add this together. I'm going to add this, and I'm going to plug here a panel. Sorry, I'm going to plug here a panel. And boom, oh my God, seriously. <laughs> All righty, beautiful. How awesome was that, huh? Our first component that adds two numbers together. Okay, so now, what, I, what do I want to add? What I would like to do is explain exposure. Um, I'm going to explain the GUID exposure. Uh, Uh, the UAD and then icons, which we're going to do in the next video. <clears throat> okay. All right. Now we're going to do a few more examples of simple components, create a vector, add two vectors together, all that stuff. We're going to do it very soon in the forthcoming videos, but before we do that, I would actually go, like to go back and finish some of the work that we've done here. I'm going to close this. I'm going to close Rhino. And then something that I would like to do is, first of all, something that is very common when retrieving data is that sometimes you actually don't want the component to work or to operate unless there has been some data fed into the component at the input. The way we can do that is by because <clears throat> if you look clear, if you look closer to the definition of the get data function, the get data function doesn't return the value. What it returns is a boolean that says whether if data was fetched from the input or not, and then that data either gets saved in this variable or not. But the return type of get data is an actual boolean. So with that, we can actually write things such as, for example, if not get data. So if we did not get any data from this input, then stop the execution of solver instance. We just do not want to solve anything. The algorithm is not going to run. Or if we here, if we did not get any data at all from the second input, again, 
I also want to return. I do not want to do anything. And if you actually look at the code that David Rotten put together as a template, this is the method, this is the, the pattern that is most common for loading inputs. Here you can see that the component loaded a plane, two numbers, and an integer. You can see that those were a plane parameter, number parameter, number parameter, and integer with some defaults, a plane in the world x, 1, 10, 10, etc. The output was a curve. And then here the component, what it did was it retrieved data for these three variables that were stored and uh, it, it did some checks, it created the spiral, and then it output the spiral through the one single output that this component has, okay? So you can see that the structure is very, very similar to what we've done. It's just a bit more complex. We will see in this series much more complex examples, don't worry. Another thing that I wanted to <clears throat> take a look is the other stuff that comes with the template of the component. First of all, we have the possibility of adding an icon to this component so that it doesn't show this white transparent thing. We're going to do that in the next video. I'm going to teach you how to load an icon and paste it here in the component. Then there's this thing called the component GUID or the global unique identifier. Every component needs to have this string of numbers that basically is their ID number. And this is useful because it allows Grasshopper to make sure that it has some kind of unique identifier between different types of components so that you can actually have components that have the same name, the same input, etc. But internally, they're different. And Grasshopper does not confuse. If we create components using the template generator, like I did for this one, the template generator will give us automatically a global unique identifier that is new. So, and very likely it will not be, there's actually a very, very small chance that this will randomly generate something that has already been, been, been generated before. But if you do it from scratch, if you create this file from scratch, you will be the one who has to provide a global unique identifier. What this is important is to keep in mind that if I were to say, you know what, instead of using the here, add new item, whatever, I'm just going to copy and paste this component and create a new version that is very similar, it just has a different name, etc. If you forget to change the grass, the, the grass up, right? the GUID, because this component has the same ID as this one, Grasshopper will complain and it will not let you execute either one of them. So if you do copy pasting, just make sure that you generate a new GUID. Uh, and there's actually, you can go, you can just Google GUI generator, like give me whatever, and then you can just generate them. It's actually, it's a very, very common uh, thing to do. Okay, that's the, the second thing. And the last thing is there is, well, there is this thing that is called exposure of the components. Uh, I'm not sure that we're gonna see it yet, but basically when you have can I, how can I say this? Let me actually run right now so that you can see. I think I'm getting into the weeds of. <clears throat> Basically, there is this additional parameter called the exposure that we can use to, you see how these components are divided into this block here, this second block here, this third block here, this fourth block here. And so we can kind of bucket components according to whatever logic we can we want to implement that can be done by adding a an override so uh, for example and that's going to be exposure so we can just add here if you type override and you type exposure it already gives you the autocomplete of what is the exposure level that you want for this component and what i can do is I can say exposure dot, oh, no, um, grasshopper exposure dot, and it's an enumerator, and I can say primary, secondary, third, fourth, whatever, or I can actually hide the component. If I use hidden, then the component will exist, uh, but it will not show up. How, why is that important? Well, for example, this component, the sample one that came with the template, 
Right now, it's showing up and it's in my grasshopper with the curves and stuff, whatever. I may not want to delete this code because I may want to read the comments and have like inspiration on how things are, but I may actually don't want it to show on grasshopper. So something that I can do is I can change this from primary, change it to hidden, for example. Okay. And if I do that, and I run and I execute Rhino now, oh, there, were, there was a build error. What happened? What is the error? I'm going to go to error list. Oh, I don't know what the error is. No, what is the error? Oh, yeah, because I still have the two. I need you then. I still have this file that, uh, yes. So I'm going to run this again. There were two classes with the same name. So it was not running. And you can see that now I run Grasshopper. I create and I go to curves, primitives, and it's not here anymore. Okay. It's actually loaded. It's somewhere internally, but it's hidden. It's not available for us to use. Okay. Beautiful. And last but not least, I don't know if you have seen any of my sort code ever, but I actually like doing this thing. <laughs> I actually like code. Sometimes in Visual Studio, it's very hard to read. And when you're seeing the same thing over and over again, you can't distinguish anymore. I like doing this thing where I like big ass headers that have like the name of what I'm looking at. I typically use this technique of using ASCII characters. So for example, let's say that I go here and I plug as comments. I plug this really large letter that says this file is a file that adds two numbers. Okay. So, and now I scroll down and I can see what the code is. But for me, I find this in the long run when I'm working with like many, many files and mix matching things. I find this idea of adding big ASCII letters very, very useful for me. So I recommend that you also do it if you want. You can choose your own type of ASCII letter. I use ANSI Shadow and I use this online editor. I actually do this most often in Visual Studio Code. I have a plugin that does this. So I invite you to consider doing this because in the long run, it gets things less confusing. All right. Beautiful. With this, this was our first component from scratch. Again, we're going to do more simple examples of adding things together, creating simple vectors, et cetera, et cetera, like we did in our C sharp prototype. We're going to do an exercise very soon, but I would like the next video to show you how to attach icons to the components that we create. So let's take a look at that in the next video. And in the meantime, maybe like this video, say hi, subscribe to the channel and all those things, if you're enjoying the content that we're doing and if you feel called to do it. Thank you very much and see you on the next video. Bye bye. Wow. Okay. That was a lot. Huh. How is everyone doing? Okay. Alrighty. So I think I'm done. I'm hungry. I want to go for lunch. Well, I'm not going to go anywhere because it's snowing a lot, but, or maybe I do because it's nice to go out with the snow. I don't know. What do you think? Should I go out in the snow for lunch or not? Hmm? Ah, I could go to my favorite coffee shop. It's warm and cozy. Uh -huh -huh. I wonder, I'm going to text my friend. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> okay. All right, folks, it was a pleasure to be with you and code together and get your input as we are. Uh, recording these videos, we will, as we typically do, we will chop them, cut them, edit them, trim them and publish them as arguably more polished videos as part of the playlist and um, see you next week. And don't forget for our 100th live stream, we're going, we're throwing, we're throwing, how do you say that in English? We're 
Oh, no, I say that in Spanish. We're throwing the house out of the window. That's a Spanish thing, actually. <laughs> it's going to be really cool. I got a few surprises uh, uh, for all of us. So really looking forward to that one. And then after that, in April, in March, when do we have? I don't know what it is. Then we have the two-year anniversary of Parametric Camp on YouTube. Uh, the actual birthday of Parametric Camp is June 15th. 2011. Wait, 2010. No, 2011. 2011. Yes, that was the first ever parametric camp. A long time ago when we did these things in person. Anyway, live stream 100th. It's going to be awesome. I hope to see all of you there. And in the meantime, I'll see you hopefully next Friday and we can continue writing our own Grasshopper plugins. Thank you very much. See you very soon. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend.